It is 3.30, and I'd like to call the meeting to order. Let's go ahead and take roll call. Ian and Lynch, present. Frazier. Fitzsimmons, present. Gade. Grimm. Here. Krieger. Here. Leckband. Here. Here. Shetty. Here. Silman. She here. Sturdivant. Here. Great. And members of staff, would you like to introduce yourselves? Gardner. Bissell. Hill. And Platt. Hey, and I'm also here. Walter. You're just not on my list. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Next is the approval of the minutes from the April meeting, which were included in today's packet. Are there any corrections needed? Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, Krieger moved to approve. Shetty will second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The motion passes. There aren't any members of public online or anything. Right? Okay. I think we will skip the public comment section. And move on to announcements. Action items from last meeting. All right. Following the last meeting, there were two action items. One was to compile a list based on the minutes from the previous meeting about pos possible ARPA usage funds and send that to members of the commission in advance of this meeting. You all should have received that email last week. Um, and then the second action, action item was that Daniel was going to follow up with the Climate Action Grant Committee for a date to meet and review applications. Um, I believe they have zeroed in on a date, though they have not met yet. Correct? Correct. All right. Um, next up, we have upcoming events. Um, things throttle back a little for us in May. <laughs> Fortunately, we had any number of Earth Day events that we participated in or hosted last month. Um, but coming up, we don't have any on the calendar for May, in part because we're recovering from Earth Month and in part because we're looking ahead to two big events in June. So we wanted to give you a heads up about them early. Um, the first one is our Spot the Hot community event. Daniel, would you like to talk a little about that? Sure. Um, we are planning an event on June 10th to take place in uh, Shelter at Mercer Park, um, a community event with fun activities to really bring attention to the Spot the Hot project and to recruit some volunteers. Um, we don't have exactly um, the groups that will be joining us um, in that event yet or the complete list of activities available, but um, it should be a, a fun time and um, um, have a lot of information about the project. Spot the Hot, of course, is the name we've given to the Heat Island mapping project that we received a grant from NOAA about. Um, so this event is meant to engage the public and also uh, serve as a volunteer recognition event. Fantastic. Um, and then we've got a compost bin sale that we uh, referenced briefly in the previous meeting. Megan, would you like to give us some details on that? Yeah, we're going to start advertising. Um, hopefully a press release goes out this week. We already have a draft and the graphic for it. Um, so communications will be putting that out this week or early next week. There is a sign-up link um, to a Google form. We'll have Johnson County community members sign up. So not just Iowa City, it's uh, Johnson County. And our Green Iowa team made the graphic and the flyer that we're using, and they will be doing the distribution event, which will happen uh, June 17th. And the location is to be determined, which they will 
contact everyone who signs up for the compost bins about the, the location. And we have 50, bar or 50 bins available, and then anyone who signs up after that will go on a waiting list. They will be sold for $25, and they can pay cash or check. Any questions about that? These like spinny bins, or what kind of bins are we? Yeah, I believe they're the rotating bins. Um, Actually, I think they're stationary bins. Oh, they're stationary. They're huge. They like I can send you the the information if you want it, and I can send you the flyer. Um, we have. I think they come with informational pamphlets, and then when they come in, the Green Iowa team is going to look at those, and then they'll have to decide whether or not they want to create an informational insert to go along with the bin so that as community members pick it up, maybe they'll have an informational insert about composting, how to maintain it. It depends on how thorough the, the sheet is that we get with them, which we won't know until they're here in a week or two. This event's a bit of an experiment for us. It's the first time we're doing something like it, but we're participating in a bulk buy with several other communities um, to help bring down the cost of those bins to make them available to residents. So if it's successful this year, um, we'll be looking to repeat it in future years. I will say we had a little bit of heartburn over it momentarily when the tornado went through town previously because we're planning on storing them in the equipment building, which lost part of its roof, though not the part over where the bins are going to be. So. <laughs> um, next up, we I have, have a, sorry, I did okay. have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so this is um, Krieger. Is the city participating in any of the Bike to Work Week programs, or is that just all community-based, organization-based led, uh, led um, events? We are participating in some of the events. Oh, that's true, but we haven't organized any ourselves. Okay. There are so many going on. But we're going to be present at the Big Grove event. Um, uh, the kickoff breakfast on that Monday. May 15th. Yeah, so the week of the 15th, Bike to Work Week. Right. Plug for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next up we have working group updates. Um, would we like to start, let's start with the Resilience Hub prioritization group, if any members would like to give an update on our recent discussions. Yeah, I, I'll start and then you can fill in any blanks I leave. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we met late in April and we discussed the pros and cons of a two-year versus a three-year model uh, on the pilot program uh, with the idea that the first year would be a planning year, then subsequent years would be implementation years. Uh, we talked about what planning activities should be required versus optional, uh, and I guess what activities should they be able to select from in those implementation years, two and three, uh, if we do a third uh, and talked about activities like solar panels, uh, stormwater management, community kitchens. Uh, we talked about potential budget uh, for the planning year and subsequent years. And I think we even talked about lowering that planning year to a six month budget uh, to help. Uh, and then we talked about the idea of uh, a climate resilience core and whether or not that would just be a first year activity or food requirement. Uh, in uh, each year of the pilot, so. Anything I missed? I think that's pretty good. Is that, any questions for anyone? Does that make, does that make sense? <laughs> we plan to have a formal memo outlining the program for you at your June meeting. How about energy benchmarking? <laughs> we had a good starter meeting. Um, it was, we went, went, wanted to hold the first one before um, Andrew left. And so uh, we were able to do that, get a little bit more background on the research he had been doing. Um, we, we sort of went all over the place, I think, <laughs> quite honestly, and talking about different topics or associated topics um, with the energy benchmarking. Um, and I think. In the end, we all agreed that, um, you know, we want to continue moving forward with the idea of benchmarking as a baseline. So again, this is just data measurement. It's not um, actionable uh, uh, reductions. It's just making sure people have the information. Um, 
and then uh, and kind of the pros of that um, and sorry I'm blanking now on other specific topics that we addressed it's been it's been a few weeks a couple weeks now I think that's a good way to put it it was a good starter meeting we have a lot to talk about we're learning learning a lot along the way um, glad to have had the opportunity to talk to Andrew about all of it um, I think that generally we all came to the idea that it was it was a, a we would like to plan a program of some sort which might be a hybrid program we might work with Green Iowa AmeriCorps on some of the programming they're working on um, looking into the idea of maybe the sitting providing incentives that might be a great idea and um, maybe a pilot to start before actually putting any kind of ordinance or anything through and of course we have to wait and find out what happens at the state level with the preemption are there any updates that you know of with that um n no we don't know I think the bill did not move forward as written but um, yeah We'll continue to monitor, and we have some behind-the-scenes updates, I think. Okay. Daniel, did you have any other updates? Um, <clears throat> just that um, um, the member of AmeriCorps who is pursuing the commercial um, energy audits has offered to come to the next meeting if the uh, working group is uh, interested in hearing from him. That'd be great. And I think we did also agree related to that state um, bill a little in the legislature that what we're talking about is benchmarking and what they've described in their bill is not. <laughs> so um, we do think we, as a group, are in a, in a consensus that it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I will say, actually, one possible update that's related is uh, following the event that we per hosted at Big Grove last week, um, we were approached by their sustainability manager who said they were interested in taking a closer look at the energy usage of their facility. And we got to talking about the benchmarking program. And um, she suggested they would be very eager to work with us as a test case. So that's a promising start. That does remind me. I think one thing that we did also chat about was what, um, what sort of volume are we talking about of potential um, sites that are located and also um, keeping in mind that we have previously learned that um, data like for instance from an American can be provided like at the neighborhood scale so if we wanted to try to figure out you know where in the community this might most be impacted um, for properties of a certain size we could at least that would help us at least um, get a better, little bit better understanding so that's just from you know past working uh, with the buildings working group uh, and the questions we were asking at the time. Are we able to get data at the neighborhood scale? We may need to follow up on that. That's, that was our understanding, yeah. All Not right. for individual properties, but at the neighborhood level scale, we could. All right, let us follow up on that one. That'd be great. <laughs> um, and then the audience mapping, I believe, has not been able to meet just yet, correct? Correct, still trying to nail down dates. But we have a great plan for that first discussion when the states get dialed in. Megan, did you still want to talk after regarding that? Like setting up? Um, Michelle's not here, so I mean, we could briefly talk, but uh, okay. I can send an email if that's easier. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. And then the final update on here um, actually, I think, serves as a nice bridge to the next discussion about uh, potential uses for ARPA dollars. And that um, is just an update on the EECGB, uh, the Energy Efficiency Community Block Grant Program, that you may remember at the close of the year we asked you to give us a series of recommendations for. Um, that program had a deadline of uh, April 28th to file um, the pre-award application. It's a complex process to actually claim the money, even though we automatically get it. 
Um, and so this is just an update to say that we did file that with the Department of Energy. Um, we did not receive any sort of response back, but we've been tracking it with several other communities that are filing simultaneously here in Iowa um, and one in Illinois, and nobody's heard anything back, which sort of tracks with the way that program's been rolling out. So um, we are proceeding on the assumption that no news is good news, um, and just letting you know that we filed it. I will say, um, as we moved through the process, we went through a number of virtual trainings with the Department of Energy about the application process, um, and then we communicated with the cohort of cities that were also claiming it. And one of the things we learned along the way is that um, there were fairly onerous reporting requirements for any projects that would be um, under a kind of like a loan pro program, which is one of the things that we had discussed as a possible recommendation. One of the things we learned is that every single project funded under that loan program for the life of the loan would need to have four quarterly reports filed on it. Um, a Davis-Bacon report, which is a prevailing wage report, Buy American, Build American, um, NEPA, so an environmental report, and then, oh, I can never remember the fourth thing in any list of four. <laughs> SHPO, so State Historic Preservation. Um, and as you can imagine, if we're funding multiple projects for that and each of them need four reports four times a year, that just felt like it was beyond our current staff capacity. So based on that, um, we are looking more toward purchasing equipment, which would be a one-time kind of purchase. We would file all four reports once and then be done with it. Um, and so now we're investigating. Um, we had looked at, I know, in our discussions, doing something potentially with the solar installation that was going to go on public works. Um, unfortunately, that, well, it's not unfortunate from a city perspective. That project is far enough along in the process now that it wouldn't qualify for those funds. So we're looking at what other clean energy investments the city is looking to make um, equipment-wise that they can be applied for, toward. Um, and right now, I think we're leaning heavily toward Board, um, some electric vehicle purchases and corresponding charging infrastructure that actually would be helpful for us in the fleet transition plan um, that we're going to work in, work in, or be working on in the coming year. So we will keep you updated as that progresses. But I do want to say, um, even though ultimately we decided not to go in the direction of a revolving loan fund, that discussion was still hugely helpful to us as staff um, because it got us thinking about the possibility of revolving loan funds for other purposes, particularly as we look to our own energy efficiency program, um, which as you know currently functions as a grant. Of course, there are now federal incentives being put on top of that. We're going to be funding it as a grant for um, this fiscal year and the coming fiscal year, and then we're going to reevaluate that program. And one of the things that we're looking at, which we hadn't been before as a result of this conversation, is the possibility of turning that into a revolving loan fund so that we could um, maximize the benefits to the community. So um, I just want to say no conversation is ever held in vain. That was still very, very useful for us. And um, in fact, investing these dollars in equipment effectively frees up other dollars that could go to something like a loan program. So um, we keep all those recommendations in mind as we look at ways forward for all our opportunities. Cool. All right, that's enough for me. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to unfinished and ongoing business. And the first item is the ARPA Climate Action Spending Recommendation. So we have about 30 minutes for this discussion. And the purpose of this item, again, is to come to a recommendation that we want to make to council about how we might, if we do indeed get it, spend $500,000 in ARPA funds towards the Climate Action Plan. So you hopefully saw in your email ahead of the meeting the list of ideas that came out of our previous conversation as well as some other ideas that have been sourced from um, people around the community. And then um, those have been, I tried to link those up with the parts of the climate action plan that they align with. Uh, the next thing that we haven't done is see how these things align with the ARPA guidelines. Um, so I'm thinking that maybe we could go through each of these items and just kind of spend a little time with each one, talk about which ones most align with the ARPA guidelines, 
and hopefully winnow our way down to a clear recommendation or two, three. I don't know. <laughs> um, yes, I did check with the city manager's office, and they suggested two to three recommendations would be ideal. So we don't have to decide on any of them. We just have to give them two or three options. Does that sound like a good way to proceed? Great. Okay, let's just go one at a time. The first one is uh, linked to buildings education piece of the plan. Um, this idea was to further educate contractors about heat pumps. This came directly from someone who um, was actively discouraged by contractors to get a heat pump and then told things that were false <laughs> about heat pumps. And so they were hoping, you know, they were wondering how many other people are being discouraged from this decision? Um, could we better educate contractors in the area? I will just say, this is Krieger, from what I know about the ARPA funding, um, is that the main intent is to, is really public health related. Um, and I think, you know, as we were, if you look back at kind of the buildings working group ideas and how that may have related back to the ARPA goals, um, I think where we talked about kind of think, you know, items related to this, um, which were kind of like the, the home rehab program, um, uh, it, a part of it was thinking about the health of the facility, you know, the, the home that was in question. And so, I mean, I, if you think about I, the education portion, maybe it's related, maybe it's a little less related. In my mind, it's probably a little less related, but unless there's other things included in it um, related to asbestos removal or um, lead removal or radon detection or, um, you know, gas buildup or I, I know there's sort of restrictions on what we can say there too, but um, in, in my mind, I think this one may, might be less related unless it expands on other public health things. Any other thoughts on that one or? We can kind of mark that as like less related and move on. I do have one fun potential note on that that's not necessarily related to the ARPA intention, but I will say um, we did last year host uh, a breakfast, it's not really a lunch and learn, it was a breakfast and learn for contractors. That's actually how we got to the realtor uh, outreach that we did. Um, and we have since stayed in communication with several of the contractors who participated in that event. And we brought in an expert on heat pumps um, to talk to them and recently learned actually that one of those contractors hired an in-house expert on heat pumps. So um, I, I would take that as a sign we're making some progress. Um, next was related to um, buildings incentives, and this idea was to expand, continue to expand the rebates for electrification and energy efficient improvements. Any thoughts on that one or how it relates to the ARPA guidelines? I guess my question is, this is sort of an, does that, is that just expanding current programs that are already in place or is that doing new programs on top of what we're already doing? And is there facilities to add more programs or versus just expanding? But I don't know how that could relate to art, but <laughs> at the same time, so. Um, I think this particular idea was coming from the point of view that a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings, so how could we you know, further accelerate energy efficient the repairs? Um, I guess this is just going into the, the idea here. Would it just be going into the same fund that we're pulling for all the other um, rebate programs? I mean, I guess this comes directly from the number two on the building working group ideas originally, which was the, um, you know, the residential weatherness, weatherization. 
Right, and how did, what was the way that you guys had linked that to the ARPA? Um, so we had, um, so energy efficiency, uh, as well as lead and asbestos mitigation while maintaining attention to indoor air quality, um, including radon mitigation, mold and pollen mitigation. Um, oh, that lower, is lower energy bills, better indoor air comfort and health. As what well as the, are the outcomes that we identified. Right. That was sort of linked to the systemic public health and economic, to address systemic public health and economic challenges. Yes. Yeah. I can offer from uh, recent staff discussions as I think about ways that we might expand our energy efficiency uh, grant program or um, especially given what we're seeing as the perceived need and, and the way it's evolving with the IRA funding. Um, we've recently been having discussions with the Affordable Housing Coalition here in Iowa City and with trailer home residents, um, in, which have fairly unique energy efficiency needs. Um, we've been trying to think of ways we could work with them on insulation. Um, a, I could see a pot of funds like this actually being put to very good use um, if we carved it out as a energy efficiency program targeted specifically for mobile homes um, where insulation actually can make a huge difference. Um, just to put it in some context, um, in a recent com uh, conversation, they confirmed for us that the average energy bill for a trailer home resident is about $350 a month, which is huge, huge. So even just getting increased insulation um, both above and below, um, and it's the below that we haven't been able to tackle so far, would I think be one potential use for those funds. Of course, there are others. If you have other ideas, we're open to them. This is Graham. Um, I feel like this has the capability of reaching a lot of people um, and people of, of different um, financial levels and stuff. And so I actually really like this one. Just want to make that comment. Thanks. Any other comments or questions on this one? I have, I have this one marked down as that it aligns better with ARPA and that we have some ideas for t how we could specifically target those funds. So I've got like a star next to this one. Yeah, this is like Bandit. Echo Ryan's comments, but you know, I think this is a, a good cross cutting um, across, you know, socioeconomic groups. And I, I really like the, the mobile home piece too. I think that's a really interesting idea. All right, in the interest of time, let's move on to number three. This one is related to transportation incentives, and this is that e-bike e vouchers idea that we talked about a bit last time. Um, this is Simmons. I think it's pretty unrelated to the ARPA stuff. Um, I don't know, in the most professional language I can think of to describe my feelings about it, I think it's just kind of lame. Um, <laughs> like it just doesn't feel like, like all the other, these other ideas are doing a lot more. So I think like we definitely have to add more to this. Also, I saw a sign on my walk today during my class um, past the Kelly's like auto service, which is like, I don't know, I, I have a moped and that's like the cheapest place you can get like any of that kind of stuff. And their like big sale for e-bikes was like $1,300 still, which I think is like a too much money to be like, we would get so little out of it since they're so expensive. I'm hearing unrelated and expensive. Yeah, and, and really to comment, I think it was John that made the comment the last meeting, um, you know, <clears throat> like she was saying, it, it's expensive. Is it going to target um, individuals of cer certain social income amount? And then really how many people is it going to impact in comparison to some of the other projects? I, I think it's minimal as well. So, Grim. This is Shetty. I think I agree on the equity issue and also the fact that it 
somebody brought this up last time that we can't really use e-bikes all year long. So I feel like the bang for the buck is not there on this one. I am not putting a star next to this one. <laughs> the next one is waste education. Um, this was an idea to implement or somehow incentivize commercial composting operation to reduce waste from restaurants. I guess I struggle, this is Krieger, I struggled a little bit with the waste um, portion ones just from a, again, re uh, um, relevancy to the ARPA. Um, I mean, I guess you could probably draw a line anywhere <laughs> through any of these that's, to some degree. But I also, I'm also thinking to maximizing impact. Um, this one had a little bit less priority in my mind. This one and the next one. Are there any feelings that differ from that? Anyone want to make a case why these might be related to ARPA or have um, important impact? Related to ARPA, I think they could have important impact. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sturdivant. I I agree. Um, it's kind of a almost really specific case, and the ARPA connection. Eh, but I think overall it would be excellent for the city to do. But again, it, how does that really relate? I feel like a case could be made for the for figuring out how to deal with industrial waste and turning some of the waste products from those bigger companies into something else, uh, just because we know that hazards from that kind of, those kinds of activities often hit certain communities harder than others. Um, I think we could make a case there, but. Maybe we'll just set that aside for now and move on to some of the others and see what comes up. <clears throat> okay, six is adapt, uh, adaptation education. And this is an idea to fund the resilience hubs that we're working on. Um, this is Fitzsimmons. Um, I think it's a pretty I don't know, I'd say this one is pretty like, has a good balance of being like related to what we've been doing and also like, you know, some like the ARPA stuff like with public health. So it's, I think it would be a pretty good like way to balance both of them. That makes sense. Um, I'll offer that John Frazier and Jamie Gade both emailed me um, knowing that they weren't going to be able to be here today. And John listed it as his top choice for ARPA funding, saying he sees it as having a potential for ongoing sustainable funding and increased capacity. And then Jamie Gade noted she feels like um, we're a little more ready to go on this program, um, which makes, a, in her mind, a good case for funding it. This is Krieger, and I would, I would agree with both those statements. Um, this was also on the list of the Buildings Working Group original list of items um, to address the as, as recommendations for the ARPA fu um, funding. You know, it impacts the future disaster mitigation through its um, resilience focus, um, provides neighborhood scale resources at the ready, could deal with a lot of um, climate related health issues. I, this is Sturdivant. I was just going to say that it seems more it, easier to figure out. We've already have a lot of this stuff discussed or in place, and I think that moving forward would be a lot easier than trying to develop a whole new program based on the other options. Okay. I will put a star next to that one. Seven is sustainable lifestyle education. Um, this is about supporting um, locally grown food, um, specifically supporting a retail location focused on locally grown food, so local procurement. 
<clears throat> etc. Which could also tie into economic development supporting um, underserved entrepreneurs. This is Graham. Um, I kind of struggled with, uh, you know, the sustainability side of this. Like, how long is this going to last? How long is the funding going to last? Um, it might have a, a direct impact on a lot of people initially. But once established, what then? Um, and so I think there's just other options that you can have more measurable outcomes. And it, it'll have a long-lasting implication. So. I could, maybe, I could maybe see this having an impact if it's based on some kind of already existing um, program or entity to help maximize or make that more sustainable. Um, but again, I do, I do agree kind of with the, the, the question there on long-term sustainability of, of it. But I do see a connection to the economic uh, recovery side of kind of ARPA. Um, so there's that too. This is the item related to establishing an urban farm, correct? This or is, I don't have the list in front of me. Oh, this is the one related to small retail location focused on locally procured food. So, yeah, there's kind of three food ones. Yeah, we could maybe take Seven, them eight, all and together. Nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, the, yeah, the three sustainable lifestyle ones, we have the local re uh, retail location for locally grown food. Um, uh, idea to help processing for local pr produce to make it easier to get into institutional markets locally. Um, meaning like, you know, it's hard for institutions to buy from local producers because of the volume and the methods of, you know, why aren't they all cut into coins? I need my carrots and coins. Um, so this idea is about helping to ease that on both the producer side and the institutional buyer side. Um, and then the last one is about, uh, yeah, incubating or, or giving land to or funding a neighborhood scale farm to produce local food and then compost the local waste. Maybe we could just start broadly with, do we feel that local procurement of food fits with ARPA? I would say to a degree, yes. Um, the whole economic stabilization for the local source funding does seem to, to a degree, and that's in that way. This is sort of, does, would it, the location need to be on city property? I, I'm not, I haven't read enough into it, because, I mean, I'm thinking of like the poor farm, which is literally like, on the cusp of mm -hmm. being city or not, if we did move forward with something, does the location have to be on city grounds or are okay. we gonna have to look outside of city lines to make it happen and is that allowable? You're talking specifically about the farm idea? Yes. Or yeah, any yeah. of them? I mean any of them because I'm just trying to think of making a farm in town <laughs> where where that would be feasible, if it has to be. Uh, again, I don't know specifics of how the ARPA works in that respect. I don't know about the ARPA requirements. I think we'd have to look into it. Um, I mean, ideally, I think we would like to keep those dollars local, right? Um, I will say w the other note that we got from Jamie Gade um, is related to this, and she just asked to note, um, as a county employee, uh, her sense is that the historic poor farm, is, she says, is quite well funded by the county and um, wanted just to note that so it could be taken into account. So there you go. Shetty here. I just wanted to mention that I have heard a lot about the need for a processing center for local food lately. And I think that if we had, it would help the farmers locally. It could also help industry locally. But I think if we had a, a place to send the food, like the school districts or something like that, that might help um, incentivize the idea or make it um, fit with the ARPA uh, guidelines mm -hmm. also. 
but I'm not certain. But I have heard a lot about people talking about this as something that could really bridge the gap. I mean, there are existing programs, and, and I, that goes back to a comment I was thinking through it. You know, it'd be great to stabilize existing, um, thinking in lines of what ARPA is going for, um, existing entities or processes um, or a way to establish something that can grow from there. You know, that it's, um, that it's self-sustaining on its own, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to jumpstart growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that means working with the local nonprofits or organizations that are already doing that work, um, and maybe it could be a partnership to talk through what are those, what, is that, what does that specific program initiative look like? Um, rather than trying to come up with something new. This is what Simmons also just noticed about like it being in town, that like um, there's a lot of like new development going on with like using hydroponics, so it doesn't have to take horizontal space. So mm -hmm. like it would be way more realistic in like a city like Iowa City that's like pretty already like urbanized most of its uh, like city limits to like be able to do something like that rather than like a sort of like. I guess like traditional farm, mm -hmm. um, it would be harder to like make it um, like a community farm, but it would still be like a way to have more urban produce like be produced, mm -hmm. or like locally. Thinking through it from a staff perspective, um, the city is un unlikely to invest money in starting a business of any sort. So it probably would be more the pass-through model, um, Matt, that you're holding up. Um, in which case, the question becomes which nonprofits, profit or profits, that we would uh, partner with on it. And have we, has anybody heard from any of those nonprofits in your contacts um, an interest in pursuing something like this? Or would we be taking an idea and trying to find a nonprofit to take it on. Now, I don't know, I'm asking the question in case any of you do. This is Grim. Um, I know with the school district, there's a partnership with like Field to Family. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I could go any, in any more detail than that, but I do know that there are efforts within the school district to get local drone mm -hmm. produce. Um, I could certainly get those details if, if need be though. Yeah, also I believe that field to family has been working, if not directly, um, on the idea of causing there to be a processing facility mm -hmm. of some kind, whether it's something that they look to do or are trying to work with um, a, mm -hmm. you know, a local farmer who might be able to take that on. And I, I think some things might be starting to be in the works. <laughs> but I could get details on that. So this would really be a recommendation then to create a pass-through fund to field to family, essentially. Yeah, I think there might be other organizations that would be in that group, in that mix, but yes. Yeah, because related is table to table, mm -hmm. right? Who's kind of a different, little bit different model, but um, you, you could almost see it as being related and having a conversation there too. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing favorable sounds about number eight, the idea of um, helping to fund a, uh, local processing to enable local food getting into institutional markets. Is that, am I hearing that positive I sense accurately? <laughs> I would, I would also, I would also add on to it though, not just institutions, because I think, in, and just in my conversations, even in the past, hearing what Table to Table does, some of the problem is on the institutional side, where, you know, um, like food is rejected because of something that was wrong with it, and so then they're able to pick up on that, that product to be able to distribute that through their program, and so, it seems like it's, it's processing, yes. Um, but who it's to specifically, I think I would leave open-ended. So going back over our list, I have three stars. 
The first one was the um, idea to expand the rebates towards energy efficiency improvements, maybe specifically targeting insulation in mobile homes. The second was um, funding the resilience hubs. And the third was uh, this processing idea. Do we feel good about making those our three recommendations to council? This is Krieger. I'll just put one more. Uh, I just have maybe a question. Um, within our accelerated actions, there is also a separate action on educate and coordinate with local agencies on health impacts. I didn't, and now I saw that there, there's been a little bit of movement on this one. Um, and this one may just be a kind of coordination effort right now. So maybe dollars aren't necessarily needed for it. Um, but I didn't know if that was something we should consider since it seems to have a direct relationship to ARPA. Um, Which one is that? Uh, it is number uh, adaptation E3. So AE3. I will say um, we do anticipate a lot more activity on that front, um, partly as a result of the heat island effort that uh, we're undertaking where we've been working now closely with public health um, on the rollout event and the engagement. And then also with the resilience hubs, um, we've looped in the uh, public health agency or Johnson County Public Health in those discussions as well. So. I think there is, I think, more that's going to be happening as a result of those two efforts. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, as far as being able to make a recommendation on a on a, another specific topic or issue there, I don't know if there's anything quite there, but I did want to understand that a little better. So thank you. But otherwise, yes, this is Krieger, I do agree with your assessment. <laughs> <laughs> This is Sturdivant. I had a question regarding uh, the installation for mobile homes. It, it, again, it goes back to territory. Is there enough mobile homes in city limits that this would? We will exhaust begin? the funds before we will run out of mobile homes. Okay. All right. <laughs> I haven't looked at anything like that, so all right. Sarah, can you help us understand my my understanding is the next steps from here, if we sort of say now, like, yes, these are the three recommendations, and is, does this go to that kind of memo writing process where we f flesh out the um, ideas of writing a little bit, or? Um, no, because we've been asked to move fairly quickly on this one, and because um, it, it's still fantasy football, so to speak, um, what will happen next is this will be recorded in the minutes, and when the minutes are submitted to City Council, we'll also attach a cover letter memo just from staff that will briefly say these were the top recommendations, um, and that if City Council chooses to move forward on any of them or would like further um, advice, um, they can circle back to us at that time to do that. So thank you all for your thoughtful discussion. Very useful. I didn't give any, was there any last comments on that? Or you feel, you feel good? Okay, great. And of course we had a city council member listening in, so <laughs> Councilman Dunn will be able to convey some of the thoughts shared today. And with that segue, I believe we're <laughs> on to new business with a strategic plan update from Councilor Dunn. Awesome, thank you all so much. Can you see what I'm presenting? There we go. Can everyone see? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect. Awesome. Well, the, the first thing that I want to say is uh, it has been awesome to uh, listen to your discussion. I want to thank you all for being a part uh, of the city's climate efforts uh, and for also being willing to serve on a, on a volunteer commission. You guys are a critical component of how our city is going to respond to the climate crisis and continues to respond to the climate crisis. And I cannot uh, express my appreciation enough for that. So thank you all for uh, for being here and for being willing to uh, take part of being the solution. <laughs> um, 
so a little overview about what I'm going to be discussing. Um, we are going to, uh, the, the counselors, I should say, uh, are all going to each of our commissions to basically do a once over and, uh, you know, high level um, discussion about uh, the city's recently approved uh, strategic plan. Uh, so I'm going to try to limit the uh, presentation to be things that are pertinent to you uh, in your capacity as our, our climate action commissioners. Um, some of the stuff may not be, but it's still important just to keep in mind. Uh, so if you have any questions at any point, uh, please just feel free to speak up um, and I will answer any questions or get answers for any questions that you might have. Uh, so with that, I will just take things away. Uh, so here we go. Uh, so first overview, um, the strategic plan goes into a lot of different uh, areas. First starts out with an introduction, an environmental scan, both environmental uh, in the, 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 the actual environmental sense, as well as the business environment, the uh, economic environment. Uh, we're going to talk about our strategic values, uh, our strategic impact areas, and action steps to address those impact areas, as well as talk about the resources and how we plan to get this done. First thing that we have to acknowledge, though, is that there are many challenges and opportunities that we face in achieving this strategic plan. Uh, first is increasing the preemption uh, of local control by the state legislature, as well as state property tax reform, higher expectations and diminishing trust in local government, uh, persistent racial and income inequality challenges, uh, workforce traction needs and staff recruitment, as well as capacity challenges, uh, the continued impacts of COVID-19, as well as general inflation and other economic pressures climate change and increasingly severe weather events like the derecho, uh, regional population growth and more demand for services while we have outdated facilities in need of remodel and replacement. Opportunities, a significant influx of federal funding uh, has come to us through ARPA as well as some other programs that are going to be coming over the uh, next year or so. Uh, so we do have some federal dollars that are coming through to help with, uh, with our strategic plan and our city's goals in the future. So the best way to predict our future is to create it. So we have uh, a variety of ways uh, through which we're going to be creating it, in which you can see mapped out on, on the uh, City of Iowa City strategy map. Uh, we start out with our values that are guiding our strategy and our desired outcomes, that being partnerships and engagement, climate action, uh, racial equity, social justice, and human rights. Our strategy that in how it will impact the community is, is focused on housing and neighborhoods, mobility, economy, safety, and well-being, and the resources that are needed to execute that strategy that is guided by our values are the facilities, equipment, technology, people, and financial assets that are necessary to keep the world going. First, let's talk about our values. Our values represent both a lens through which we will approach our work, as well as a desired uh, end state when our work is completed. Our values are embodied in every element of the strategic plan and the work we do as city leaders. Uh, our values for this purpose is racial equity, social justice and human rights, again, climate action, and then partnership and engagement. So how will we know if we've achieved our vision for racial equity, social justice, and human rights? Uh, we will know that our community celebrates and welcomes cultural diversity, that our community acknowledges and commemorates accurate historical cultural perspectives. We will know that every resident understands how systemic inequities have disadvantaged some populations and have skills to disrupt uh, existing biases. Uh, we will also know that systemic barriers and, pol and policies, programs, and services are proactively addressed before they become a problem. Uh, we build partnerships that facilitate equal opportunity and access. Uh, we, community decision makers, reflect the diversity of the community, as well as equity, inclusion, and belonging uh, being clearly identifiable in all city operations and activities. How will we know if we've achieved our vision for climate action? Something that's particularly pertinent to you guys. Uh, so the way we envision this is the world looks to Iowa City to copy our innovative carbon reduction strategies. Uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions are achieved across all sectors. Every household is prepared for extreme heat, cold, and weather events caused by climate change. A biodiverse environment is found throughout our community. Our children's water, air, and soil quality is better than it was for us and those before us. Residents choose to take climate actions, such as riding the bus, shopping locally, and conserving energy, as well as health and safety, health, safety, and sense of community are improved for all. 
how we know if we've achieved our vision for partnership and engagement. This is, this is a pretty complex one. <laughs> the public believes that opportunities for public input are worthwhile and sincere. Public dialogue is successful. Decision making is transparent. Every resident is routinely reached by, a city in a, by the city in a way that aligns with their preferred method of communication. We're going to where people are. <laughs> uh, neighborhoods are a source of grassroots community building and prosperity, as well as community stakeholders trust and openly communicate with the city. And finally, public-private partnerships are common and a natural component of every solution that we engage in. So this is just a question that I want to leave with you, uh, and for you to you know consider as I'm as I'm speaking, both and uh, as well as in the future uh, as you work uh, to improve our community on this commission. What are some of the examples of how you can carry these values out in your board and commission? I think it's a little bit easier for you guys than some of the others. So, uh, again, sharing my appreciation for your very specific and very important work to our community and to our planet. Impact areas and action steps. Impact areas. Uh, so the areas that we want to impact are our neighborhoods and housing market, mobility, economy, safety, and well-being. Um, for the purposes here, though, we're going to focus on uh, explaining first, uh, I guess, we already know this stuff. The vision is the why. It's the long-term and aspirational. The strategy is what. It's the long-term and guiding. Uh, and our action steps are how. But going back from here, the impact areas that we're going to be discussing are neighborhoods and housing, as well as ooh, mobility. So neighborhoods and housing. This is our vision for what we want Iowa City to be as a, as a council. Uh, we want Iowa City to be a collection of authentic, vibrant neighborhoods and districts by way of internal and external streets and trails. Each community member has, has safe, easy access to everyday facilities and services within uh, a 15-minute walk or bike ride. Neighborhoods are compact and socially diverse, with a variety of housing choices and at least one place serving as its center. Permanent affordable housing choices are dispersed throughout the community. New higher density development blends with existing buildings and shapes a, a comfortable human scale pedestrian environment. Public spaces are inviting and active, with people recreating and socializing in parks, natural areas, tree lined streets, streetscapes, all enhanced with public art and placemaking initiatives. Our first strategy for doing this is to update the city comp plan and zoning code to encourage compact and diverse housing types and land use. Our second strategy is to partner in projects that serve as models for desired future development. Third strategy is to create inviting and active outdoor spaces with unique and engaging recreation offerings. And the fourth strategy is to address the unique needs of vulnerable, vulnerable populations in LMI neighborhoods. Second impact area that is particularly pertinent to you guys is mobility. The city's vision is that community members of all socioeconomic statuses easily, safely, and comfortably travel using multiple transportation uh, uh, ooh, multiple modes of transportation year-round. Commuters choose to walk, bike, or bus at least half of the time, and an increasing number of trips are fueled by clean energy. Regional collaboration has created a strong multiple multimodal modal network that links Iowa City to neighboring communities. Highly traveled corridors have separate trails or comfortable of uh, yeah or comfortable safe lanes for bicyclists. Bicyclists, while prioritizing the needs of pedestrians, bicyclists, transit riders, and other emerging forms of transportation are weighted greater than those of automobile drivers and adjacent property owners. The first strategy to achieve this is to expand the access and convenience of climate-friendly and regionally connected public transit. The second strategy is to design and maintain complete streets that are comfortable and safe for all users. And the third strategy is to grow and prioritize bike and pedestrian accommodations. Let me change this one thing. There we go. Sorry, my little uh, screen was blocking some of my text. Resources. So the tool, these are the tools that is going to make every part of our, our strategic plan possible. Um, we know that we need to have facilities, equipment, and technology. We know that we need to uh, have the people to get it done, and we know that we need to have a tax base, the money, uh, to get it done as well. Uh, so we're planning on investing in next generation facilities, as well as uh, safe and healthy workspaces. We're pursuing high-performance governance that makes government more efficient, as well as rewarding technology and innovation in our internal practices. In, our, in terms of making sure that our people are here and that we have the people to continue to do the projects that are necessary to get this done, 
done. Uh, we want to establish the city as an employer of choice in the community and in the region. We want to build a diverse talent pipeline for staff and boards and commissions, as well as enhance engagement, uh, engagement, welcoming, and inclusion to the community. Um, financially, we need to grow the tax base, diversify our revenue sources, and leverage outside funding while maintaining healthy reserves and a prudent debt strategy that we have for about or uh, for at least a decade. Alignment. These are just some of our, our partners that we are working with, uh, or at least that we are foreseeing working with over the next uh, basically five to 10 years uh, to get this plan done. Uh, Better Together 2030, the University of Iowa, uh, Envision East Central Iowa, as well as the Department of in Division of Master Plans. Some things to note about what's not in the strategic plan. 99% uh, of the city's activities day to day, uh, unexpected things that come up as well as timely opportunities that can again, still help us achieve our strategic plan goals and other goals, as well as other major ongoing projects. So that is my presentation um, on the city's strategic plan. There is more to the strategic plan. It's it's a dense piece of literature that I would encourage folks to at least give a glance. There's a, a copy of it online uh, at icgov.org forward slash strategic plan. Um, again, I don't want to make you guys uh, spend a lot of time on things that aren't necessarily pertinent to the Climate Action Commission. So I truncated this uh, presentation a little bit, but there's plenty more uh, that you could dive into if you so chose. Um, at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Um, if not, again, I really want to reiterate how appreciative we at the city are um, of, of your service on, on a commission, especially a commission as important as Climate Action Commission. All right. Oh, sorry, I do have a question. So, this is Einan Lynch. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering how, um, <clears throat> how you or you as a council think about climate action as it relates to economic growth? Because I know a regular metric, and as you put in that um, one of those last slides about uh, the financial aspect of this plan, that we need to grow our tax base, and that's a common metric of success for a city, right? Like how many new housing units do we have, or how much, um, how much have we grown our tax base, how, many, how much are we growing our population? But we know that unlimited growth or continued growth um, is incompatible with addressing climate change. So I'm wondering how you think about, like, how can we address climate change when our metrics for success incentivize activities yeah. that are in conflict with reducing energy usage? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the first thing that I'm going to say is I can't speak for the whole council on this um, particular question aimed at like what the whole council thinks. Um, but I can share my, my personal perspective. Um, one of the things that we do know is that we need to have, uh, you know, more access to things like affordable housing, more density in the community. Uh, and those types of, of increased density and development create both a tax base as well as a pretty efficient form uh, that, uh, I guess, like building form that allows people to live here. Um, I think at the same time, we have to be willing to uh, weigh our priorities, uh, you know, weigh growth versus uh, our, our, our responsibility to, to the planet and to, to climate. Um, and incidentally, uh, create more costs for people who are wanting to develop here. Um, I think personally that we need to be doing more to create uh, individually um, independent and I guess I should say energy independent uh, new projects and developments uh, requiring things like solar uh, arrays uh, be connected to to building development uh, and requiring different energy efficiency standards um, across new developments as well. Uh, so I think it's a comprehensive thing that we have to do. We have to you know do a rewrite of the zoning code. We have to work uh, with our other community partners. Um, but at the same time, we have to understand that we do have limited capacity, we have limited land, and that land is only going to be able to provide so much for us. Um, and I think at the same time, again, this, this is just such a complicated 
uh, you know, thing to go into. Uh, we have to be looking at what we can do on the fringes of the city and internally uh, within the city. Uh, what what we can do to be more sustainable um, in the long term. I, rem- I I listened to your conversation over, uh, you know, a local urban farm and things like that are a great way uh, to to do something like that to reduce carbon emissions to uh, ensure that people are actually having the skills and food to have sustainable food rather than food that is shipped uh, from California and and causing problems in that particular regard. Um, This is all to say, all of this is kind of just my random thoughts. Um, It is a serious concern, (laughs) at least of mine, balancing that growth question uh, versus the, the, the climate question. And I cannot say enough that that question is made more difficult for us by the fact uh, that the, the, the state government continues to uh, constrict what we can actually uh, do with our tax base. So they shrink the tax base, which encourages systemically uh, us to say, OK, we need more people to come here so that we have more money because we can't do much with what we are, are given by the state government. Sorry if that's a little bit rambly. Does that answer your question, though? I, maybe not perfectly. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Uh, well, I will just say a way, um, you know, that you can uh, come to us or request uh, support from us. You like, feel free to ask us about what top line metrics of success your Climate Action Commission would recommend, because um, I uh-huh. do think those metrics, um, you know, when we're looking. At, the metrics determine on, determine what we pay attention to and how we consider our success. So if we change the metrics, um, it starts to change our actions as well. Absolutely. I guess related to your, com- this is Krieger, um, related to your comments about um, kind of the challenges with, uh, you know, the, the legislature and, and kind of hamstringing us a little bit on what we can do. Um, do you foresee the ongoing use of the emergency levy to help finance some of the climate action goals that are that are being outlined. Um, I, I I guess I'm honestly not knowledgeable enough to really answer that question. <laughs> um, I know that there's been some discussions in the legislature to get rid of the emergency levy altogether, which would certainly complicate uh, our ability to use that for climate action. Um, I, 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 at this point, I, I really don't know that I can, I can answer that. Um, I can certainly get back to you um, and, 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 you know, answer that question a little bit further. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure that I can, I can answer that holistically at this point. Okay, thank you. And I, I should say that also, I just joined the council in January, so I'm still learning a lot too. So it's not like, you know, oh, I'm just not paying attention to things or anything, but there, I still have a lot to learn. No worries. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for coming and sharing uh, about the plan with us. I think um, it's really important strategic plan and um, I think it's you guys have come a long way from even the last plan it's really neat to see uh, the values laid out so clearly Uh, I thank you for coming and giving us an overview absolutely thank you all and I would just say if if there are any questions that people have as follow-up or uh, that you would like either me personally or the council to work on either to get answered uh, or projects to work on in general, I would very much encourage folks to reach out. Um, and I, I would love to to work on it. So thank you all again for having me. <clears throat> all right. Finally, we have a recap. So our next meeting is going to take place Monday, June 5th, here in this room at our usual time, 3.30 to 5 p.m. Um, And in terms of actionable items for the commission, working groups, and staff, I have only that we'll be typing up the three recommendations in a cover letter to go with our minutes to city council. Um, Is there any other actionable item I didn't catch? It was a pretty fairly straightforward meeting. The planning of the... Working group. The working group. Working group, yeah. And the working groups will meet. (laughs) Take action. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's that's it.
I have a motion to adjourn? This is Krieger. I move to adjourn. Second, Grim. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks for your time, everyone.